Good afternoon. My name is Daryl Tarver and I'm co-chair of the MSBA's Diversity Inclusion Committee. I want to thank you all for joining us and welcome you to our program. The Diversity and Inclusion Committee, as the name suggests, aims to promote diversity and inclusion within the state bar and the legal profession in Maryland, consistent with the MSBA's diversity statement. We aim to make sure that the profession reflects and is able to serve all of its diverse client population, regardless of race, color, age, gender, gender identity, disability, sexual orientation, or other characteristics. Part of our charge as a committee is to create an environment for all individuals to join, thrive, and lead regardless of their background. So with that in mind, I'm excited to present to you our webinar program, Making Yourself Relevant, How to Thrive as an Attorney in Turbulent Times. By way of background, when we had this originally conceived of this program, we were more focused on the COVID-19 pandemic and all of its impacts on, its, on our personal and professional lives. But since then, we've learned about the killings of George Floyd and other Black Americans and the social unrest that has followed. Those events have disturbed many, causing turbulence within our personal and professional lives as well. So this program is aimed generally at helping lawyers to stay afloat and to continue ascending in their careers and in their lives, despite the turmoil. Our panelists will provide tips and strategies for business and professional development, health and wellness and they'll provide perspectives on managing personal and professional demands in the midst of crisis. So I wanna take a moment to thank our co-sponsors, the J. Franklin Bourne Association, the LGBT, LGBTQ Bar Association of Maryland, Maryland Hispanic Bar Association, the Maryland Municipal Attorneys Association, the MSBA State and Local Government Section, the Sobol Soboloff Jewish Society, and the Women's Bar Association of Maryland. We have two moder moderators this morning or this afternoon who will be guiding our discussion. The Honorable Judge Michael Reed of the Court of Special Appeals of Maryland and Mark Jaskolski from the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office, who is also the co-chair or the, the chair of the LGBTQ Bar. At the conclusion of our session, Treble, who has partnered with the MSBA, will be hosting a, a networking session. You will hear more about tre Treble later on in the program. So without further ado, I'll pass the podium to Judge Reed. Thank you. You are muted, Judge Reed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, and appreciate your comments and your thoughts. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our three outstanding speakers, each bring their unique perspective on dealing with this crisis we find ourselves in. Uh, the first of our speakers is Alicia Suter. She leads the professional services team um, at her company, has more than 20 years growth play 20 years experience helping lawyers and executives accelerate sales performance and revenue growth. She is particularly passionate about helping individuals create greater impact in how they lead, work, and sell. She received her MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg Graduate School of Management and her BA from Augusta, Augustana College in Illinois. I'll introduce each speaker separately as they come up. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Reed. Well, it is an honor to connect with all of you amongst the airwaves today. And uh, in just a bit, Lisa will be talking about how to take care of yourself from the inside out. This portion of the program is really gonna focus on how we think about how we care for ourselves from the outside in. In other words, how do we make sure that we're caring for our network so that our network can care for us? And I think that that's particularly relevant in light of the fact that many people have recently been concerned that diversity and inclusion outcomes 
could take a step backwards in our organizations in light of some of the impacts of COVID. And so one of the things that will be important to all of us is that we want to be able to make sure our organizations are staying accountable to the outcomes that each of us finds important and relevant. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with a network of key relationships that can support our interests, who are invested in us and the things that we care about just as much. So with that, let's dive right in. And Bill, if we could go to the next slide, please. So if you are like many of the attorney clients that I have been coaching recently, it can feel like there is an ever widening gulf between you and your most important connections or contact as things like distancing and work from home and other factors keep us separate and distant and apart from one another. And that's not even uh, addressing the challenge of how we then go out and find new relationships to add into our network. But let me uh, rest assured and, and help you um, know that there are lots of authentic ways in which you can stay connected to people in your network today. And I'm going to address those in just a minute. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to spend just a second talking about the notion of selling. Now, um, there is a great book called um, To Sell as Human, written by a lawyer turned social researcher turned writer named Daniel Pink. And in To Sell as Human, he makes the case that regardless of whether we have the word sales in our job description or our titles, that we are all in the business of selling almost all of the time. Whether it's selling our services to prospective clients, it's selling an idea to a supervisor or a director or a board of directors, whether it is just simply trying to convince colleagues and friends to get on board with initiatives or movements or things that we find important and relevant to, our, to the world and to society at large right now. Um, we are all in the business of selling something, whether that be our services, ourselves, our ideas, our initiatives. Now, if you are finding yourself feeling a little reluctant to think about how you add great selling responsibilities to uh, your workload, uh, also rest assured that you are like many people. In fact, research will tell us that the majority of Americans actually find the idea of selling fairly distasteful. And no wonder, because the uh, ways that we are taught and see selling happen uh, looks oftentimes as a manifestation of a process that is very much about self-interest. So how do we manipulate other people to give us what we want, but just faster, right? So self-interest. So I think a more productive and frankly, more authentic way to think about the idea of selling something is to think about it as an act of service. Now, given that I'm on a webinar with lots of people who probably went to law school and probably went to law school in the act or interest of wanting to serve others, I'm hoping that that doesn't feel so inauthentic or strange. So if we could go to the next slide, Bill. There are three things that I think are underscoring tenets if we want to think about selling something as an act of service. So first and foremost, we have to think about selling something as an opportunity to initiate and invest in relationships that are authentic, meaning that we have to actually care and show concern to people who are in our network of important or key relationships. And in, in, in order to show care and concern, we have to be proactive or very intentional about seeking to serve the problems that people in our network might have at the moment not just ones that can get us paid or advance the only ideas that we find important. And so the third tenet is that we have to be willing to put our attention and our intention around meeting people where they're at, figuring out what's the most important or relevant to them, and figuring out how to be of service to advancing those things just as well, whether that be in the realm of professional interests or objectives or priorities or personal interests and projectives, or priorities and objectives. So if we could go to the next slide. If we're gonna put all of that together in a little bit of pragmatic action, and we wanna stay connected to our network, particularly in light of the fact that we are uh, not having the same kinds of opportunistic moments to meet and intersect with other people, we need to be creative in finding the three authentic ways that might be interesting for people to engage back with us. 
So I like to think that there are at least three ways in which we can brainstorm or figure out an opportunity to connect with someone in a way that feels like they're getting cared and concerned for and that we're looking proactive in the ways that we might be helpful to somebody else. And so if we can always anticipate uh, what we might know about a particular person and their interests, there are at least three ways that we could have something authentic to bring into a conversation. One is that we might invite people to join us in something. So if there's something that others might have or find valuable in getting access to, we could issue an invitation. Secondly, we could create introductions to, some, to someone. So if there are people in our network that would benefit the other person, uh, we might create an opportunity to make that introduction or connection. And then thirdly, we have insights. So we have content, we have wisdom, we have information or opinions that could benefit or help other people given what they're interested in or care about. So what does this look like pragmatically? So if we could go to the next slide. Now, most people uh, probably don't want to be reinventing the wheel and figuring out an authentic in every single time they think of somebody else they want to connect with. And so some of the best business developers create what I like to call an inventory of authentic ends. It's sort of our fallback menu of the moment that helps us think about what we might have that could be of value to the most or to most of our connections and contacts. And so right now in the time of COVID and all of the unrest that Daryl was talking about, there are lots of authentic ends that we might issue or offer up to people. So invitations, uh, what are some of the kinds of invitations that might make sense right now? Well, because we can't obviously physically meet people as often as we'd like um, and lunching and going to coffee with people or cocktailing with others might not be possible. We can always turn to this platform. So you could still invite people to virtual coffees or virtual cocktails with you or just a virtual bite. Um, the other thing though that we could do is that we could do things like uh, create opportunities for people to gather, again, maybe in a virtual platform, but that could combine personal or professional interests. So I, I have some clients right now who are creating roundtable opportunities for people to come together and be in conversation about what the future might hold. What are some of the best practices about getting your workforces back to work? Um, how do we think about some of the ways that we might anticipate opportunities so that we cannot just recover, but that we can thrive and flourish as organizations or companies or firms? Um, I've had other clients create things like game nights or virtual cocktail or happy hours with personal connections, friends, as well as professional contacts. Um, and of course, there are lots of people who might be on the phone today who are at law firms or in departments that are creating and producing educational or training webinars. Those are things that might provide an authentic reason to invite someone to something that you're doing. Introductions. So given what's going on in the world today, are there subject matter experts that might be in your circle or network that other people would find valuable to hear or learn from, or just have an opportunity to bounce ideas or possibilities off of? Creating or brokering those introductions now obviously could lead to work further down the road, but it's absolutely a great opportunity to just offer a resource in the connection of a relationship. We could also introduce people as they're sort of isolated as a way to create uh, collegiality and a network of, a, of other folks who are going through similar circumstances and in, in similar times. So are there professional or personal contacts who share similar interests or affinities that might find each other fun or helpful to know? Those are introductions. Uh, another example of an intro invite combo of that a client of mine has done recently is that a group of female partners at a law firm wanted to stay connected with a number of female professional connections and clients. So they gathered groups together to do a virtual um, self-care uh, happy hour, if you will, that served as a meet and greet for all of the invitees to know one another. So that list was carefully curated and they featured an esthetician and the founder of a makeup company as guest speakers to kick off that fun happy hour uh, event. And then finally, insights. You have many insights probably at your fingertips right now as your firms or organizations produce things like client alerts, best practices, checklists, templates, forms that might be shared as examples or uh, helpful resources. 
Um, we're also finding that people are finding ways to stay connected through their personal insights right now. So I've got a client who sends out to uh, her friends and contacts that uh, her weekly playlist. Um, particularly those folks that she knows are very much into music. I have another client who has been leveraging the experience and wisdom of her team as she curates a question of the week to solicit lots of opportunities and ideas. For example, which Netflix movie are you watching that you found um, particularly fun or compelling? What book are you reading this week? What's your favorite recipe that you've tried? What are your tips and tricks for surviving as a parent turned teacher? Um, all of those things. So she curates that at the beginning of the week, they have a whole list of things, and then she shares that back out with her team so that everyone can leverage that group insight to share with their contacts and colleagues and people who are important to stay connected to. So an inventory of authentic ends. Next slide, please. In addition to having an inventory of authentic ends at your fingertips, it might also be helpful to literally get out of your head who you should stay connected with. And so I encourage people to write down the top 10 to 20 contacts that are important to stay connected to so that you remember who is important to you, who you need to be cultivating warm and helpful and friendly and proactive relationships with. And then you can mix and match to your inventory of authentic ends. All right, next slide. In addition to identifying your top 10 to 20 contacts and then issuing an authentic reason to engage with you, you probably, I'm sorry. I meant to tell the listeners that and people who are viewing that if they want to ask a question, uh, they can type in a question and then they'll be asked of the speakers. Uh, so you can use your chat box to do that. And uh, we encourage folks to send in questions and Mr. Jaskowski will present those. Thank you. Perfect. And um, as you are connecting with people, my guess is that many of you are probably doing that by video conference or a large portion of your connecting or reconnecting by video conference. And so there are just a few things that I would suggest to keep in mind as you are connecting with your network that allow you to put your best foot, or in this case, your best face forward. So remember that in a virtual medium, all we can pay attention to is your face. And so people are paying attention to your face. So be sure to know where your camera is at any given time so that you are making eye contact with your camera. And that sometimes, uh, and that at, at times it feels like you are having a personal conversation. Um, be sure you're not, your camera isn't on you such that you have a this sort of vision or view on camera or this vision or view. And I've been encouraging people to pay attention to what I call your resting face. Right. So as many of us are on conference calls like this on video, uh, we may not be speaking all the time. We're listening. And yet everyone is still paying attention to what you look like. And so be aware that if you have a resting face that looks very serious or uh, perhaps skeptical, um, people may be interpreting that as doubtful or unbelieving or distrustful. And so pay attention to some of those cues as we connect primarily through this this medium. Um, the other thing I would just uh, suggest to you is with, if you are in a group of people and you are appearing, um, know that appearance sort of counts double right now. And so if you'd like to stand out, um, one way to do that is to make sure that you're wearing uh, something that allows people to, to have their eyes drawn to you. So things like jewel tones, avoiding florals or stripes that can tend to be distracting, um, allow you to, again, put your best face forward. All right. I think the last tip that I have for you today in the time that I have with you at least is the notion of how to introduce yourself. And I thought I would include this because as we network, um, and which I know some of you will be doing uh, right after this portion of the program, you'll be asked to introduce yourself. And that is a typical part of networking. Most of us, when we get asked the question, who are you and what do you do? We tend to answer with some version of I am a fill in the blank. I am a corporate attorney. I am a um, real estate litigator. I am, I settle, so I, I am some kind. And while those are, and while those are actually factually true, it doesn't always uh, help us separate ourselves from the past, and it certainly doesn't help us be memorable. So as you get ready to participate in the networking session following this panel conversation, you might quickly pull together what I like to call a quick pitch. And that could follow what I like to think of as your introductory, introductory mad libs. 
So instead of I am a transactional lawyer, um, you might substitute it with I verb of some kind target market with these kinds of problem solved. So I verb, I help, I counsel, I assist, I advise, I support, I work with this kind of target market, real estate developers with this kind of problem solved to figure out what to do when the market unexpectedly goes upside down. I support VPs of HR to figure out how to get their employees back to work safely while still stay, staying in the boundaries of rules and regulations. So I verb, target market, problem solved as a different version of a quick pitch introduction. So I think my time with you is probably up and I've, I know that Lisa's got lots of great information about how to keep yourself thriving and flourishing from the inside out. But I will pause to take any immediate questions and of course we'll have an opportunity at the end of the program as well. Thank you, thank you, Alicia. This is Mark. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, do you have any recommendations on platforms to use in terms of uh, that you would recommend using versus Zoom or you know uh, uh, Google Meet? Oh, there, you know, there's there's a whole bunch that have come out now. Do you have any recommendations on that? Ah. Uh. Well, that's a complicated question. I think it, some of it depends sort of on what is best supported uh, given your internal uh, IT and, and support structures. I find that most people probably, if I took a quick poll, because it's accessible to everybody without sort of an enterprise-wide uh, system is Zoom. Um, and Zoom, frankly, I think as a uh, trainer um, and facilitator has the most flexible functions like breakout rooms and polling and chat features that make interactivity a little more robust, but that's a personal preference. I just have, and just one other question, not to hold everybody up, uh, in terms of like a, and I, you might've went into this a little bit, like a, in terms of a 30 second elevator speech, is that something also you would recommend? Absolutely, everybody needs to have what I call the quick pitch or an elevator speech, because we ask, get asked that question time and, get, time and again, what do you do? The other, uh, thing that I would say, a headline message that I think everybody needs to have a really compelling and interesting response to is an answer to the question, what's new? Particularly as we connect to people and to say nothing or same old, same old, or just busy, busy, busy all the time. Um, those are not necessarily interesting answers that help strategically create connections or help people think about something that they might not have known about you uh, before they talk to you. So I would really encourage people to always have a quick pitch and a what's new as a headline message um, ready and prepared to go. Wow. Thank you, Alicia. Fantastic beginning to today's program. And uh, the purpose of today is really to do exactly what Alicia has already done, which is to bring us uh, professional ideas, how to grow professionally, how to meet these current challenges tools and strategies, and she did a fantastic job of doing that. Um, so we appreciate it. Don't hesitate to continue to ask questions and we encourage you to do so. Uh, the next, uh, and so Mark, I'm sorry, <laughs> I cut Mark off. Mark's got to talk about something else. Sorry, Mark. Oh, and that is, um, yes, for everyone to join us afterwards um, for Treble, they are doing a uh, virtual, I guess you call it meet and greet. Um, the information is on the screen here, uh, everyone will have a chance to speak and network with each other. Um, it is a different Z Zoom uh, meeting. That number is 870-526-83210. And I'm sure that's gonna be put up at the end um, for everyone to be able to go and, and take part in that. They are helping us and they are sponsoring part of this. So um, we look forward to everyone uh, taking the time to do that, You know, make some new connections uh, as a result of this. Thanks, Mark. Our next speaker is uh, Lisa Kaplan, LCSWC. Lisa is the director of the Maryland Lawyers Assistance Program and joined the MSBA in July of 2009. She has over 25 years of experience in her field and extensive experience working with both lawyers and judges in the areas of mental health, substance abuse, and wellness, as well as managing an employee assistance program which she does for the federal courts in six states. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her family and friends. She's a paddle boarder. She likes sailing, rock climbing, and doing triathlons. So Lisa, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Felicia, you were awesome, but I learned that I'm not supposed to be wearing uh, florals, but we'll just run with that for, for today. So we're gonna talk about emotional resilience during these uncertain times. And we're gonna talk about COVID, we're also gonna, the social unrest and just tie it all together that I really feel that self-care is the foundation in whatever you're doing. So it will help you be more motivated, more productive. St taking a step back and taking care of yourself is really what's important. Because I think what COVID has done is it's put a blanket of stress over us. Everything that we do on a daily basis, whether we go to the mailbox or we go to the grocery store, everything that we've done that has been very normal for us under normal circumstances, we now have to think about. And we have to think about how we're gonna stay safe during these times. So it's really important to really take care of yourself. Next slide, please, Bill. So what to expect during these uncertain times? Well, I think what to expect is whatever you are experiencing because these are uncertain times and we don't really know with all the change what to expect at this point. So if you are feeling unsettled or you are feeling fear or numbness or disbelief or anxiety, depression, I've actually had people talk with me about what they describe as the COVID meltdown where they are feeling just a rush of emotions that they don't really know where they come from. So whatever you're feeling, and I don't like to use the word normal, but because this is, we don't know what normal is, anything you are feeling is okay. And it's really important to be, to be patient with yourself and realize that you need to take a step back and you need to take time for yourself. Next slide, please. So trauma, there are a lot of different types of trauma, but what I wanna talk about for a minute is just collective trauma. This is the trauma that goes beyond the individual, but it affects the community. This is what happens during a natural disaster like COVID or a hurricane or racial injustice or the Holocaust or bombing or something like that where it affects the community and it shatters their security and they experience a lot of fear and uncertainty. And that is what we are experiencing. We are just having a flood of a lot of different things that are hitting us at one time. And again, going back to taking care of yourself, self-care, taking a step back, taking time. I've worked with lawyers my, almost my entire career. You don't take care of yourself, and it's really important to take a step back and take care of yourself. Otherwise, you're going to have a really hard time taking care of your clients and everything else during these changing times. Next slide, please. So self-care. So how do you take care of yourself? First thing I think is really important is to avoid information overload. Look at how much information you are listening to. We are bombarded by the television. We are bombarded through social media. Any place we turn, there's information. And you really have to look at how is your body feeling? Is it raising your anxiety? Is your blood pressure going up? Are you feeling anxious? And that is the time to turn off whatever it is that you're watching and take a step back. I even think setting a timer for 15 minutes, a half hour at the most, get your information, turn it off, and really take a step back to take care of yourself. Obviously avoid solving problems with anything that's a quick fix. So that could be drinking, it can be shopping, it can be social media, anything that you find that you are avoiding what is going on to the extent that it is having adverse effects. I'm not saying don't watch Netflix, but if you find that every time you feel upset you're turning to something else, then it's time to take a step back and really look at really resolving what is going on with you. I really like mini mindful moments. Mindfulness is paying attention to what is going on at the moment. It helps you to quiet your mind and it helps that calmness. This can be taking a deep breath. It can be getting up and taking a walk around your house or walking up and down your stairs. It, it's moments that you take that help you to ground yourself. I use Headspace. I know people who use Calm. There's all kinds of apps that remind you to breathe. It's really important just take those times just to to take a step back, even set a timer, because I know with myself, I can sit at my desk at my home and time just goes by. I forget to stand up, I forget to take a break, I forget to eat, so it's really important to set a timer, get up, do something for a few minutes, and get a break. Exercise moments. Working with lawyers, I often have my clients say, well, if I can't work out for an hour and a half, I'm not gonna work out. And my question is, why are you working out for an hour and a half? What about 20 minutes? What about 15 minutes? I train for triathlons. I will do a hit class for 20 minutes. I will walk up and down my stairs. Just keep moving. Find a way just to build movement into your life. And if you can't do an hour and a half, then just build in pieces as you can. 
So what are your anchors? If you think of a boat and you think of a boat anchored in the middle of rough waters, the anchor is keeping it from being unhinged. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for what are your anchors? It may be your cup of coffee in the morning. It may be your dog waking you up. It may be the sunrise or the birds or the smell of cut grass. But think of what are your anchors and what doesn't change most likely when everything else is changing. And even thinking about these things can really help bring you back to feeling really, really grounded. Stay hopeful, try to stay hopeful. I think that surrounding ourselves virtually with emotionally healthy people is really, really important. We have to be careful of, there's a lot of different opinions out there, but we have to be careful of being drawn into maybe conversations you don't wanna be drawn into and possibly with intent, looking at your relationships that you're having right now and look at, do you need to pull back a little bit to keep yourself feeling a little bit more grounded? Spend time outdoors. I find that being outdoors, unless you have really bad allergies, outdoors can be really, really grounding. Take a walk, go outdoors, have a window, look out the window, just any way that you can kind of bring the outdoors in, it can be really helpful. And ask for help if you need help. It takes courage to ask for help. And um, I've had lots of people asking for help over the past few days. It's been very overwhelming, but it's been great that people have been reaching out. Speak kindly to yourself. I think that if we spoke to our friends the way we speak to ourselves in our head, we would not have any friends. We are very, very critical of ourselves. It's really important to look at how you're talking to yourself. And if a loved one or a friend came up to you, how would you talk with them? How would you help them resolve the problem? I'm pretty sure that it wouldn't be the way you talk to yourself in your head. If you're feeling anxious, oftentimes what we do is we overanalyze. Why am I feeling anxious? What is going on? By doing that, you are bringing a lot of attention to that anxiety and you are actually making it worse. So the best thing to do is to rather say, rather than saying, I feel anxious, is to say anxiety and just note it. Imagine there is a cloud going through the sky and anxiety is on it and it keeps on going. Imagine a leaf on a river and it just keeps on going. You kind of want to note and bring your attention to it. What you don't want to do is bring so much attention to it that that anxiety just increases. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to teach you a technique. I have two non-traditional techniques that I want to teach you. And um, if you're on video and you don't want to be on video, that's fine. It's They don't take very long to teach. And then hopefully you have this PowerPoint, you can refer back to them. The first technique is, it deals with the vagus nerve, which connects the brain to the major organ systems. And this is basically your, your fight or flight or freeze. This is what tells you I'm going to live or I'm going to die but oftentimes it gets overwhelmed and it needs to be refreshed. So one way of doing that is if you are looking straight and keeping your head straight with your eyes, you're just going to look to the right. Without straining, you're just gonna to look to the right, not at anything in particular, but you look to the right until you either yawn or you swallow. And if it doesn't happen right away, that's okay. Again, you can practice that. Once you yawn or swallow, you can look back to the left and you wait until you yawn or you swallow. The yawn is refresh and the swallow is digest. Again, you just look to the right with your eyes until you yawn or swallow. And then you look to the left. What that does is it physiologically calms down your nervous system. I have used this when I've been trying to go to sleep. I've used this in the middle of the night. And I've had clients who have said that they just love this. But it, does, it may take a little practice because we don't have a lot of time today to do that, but it's something that is very, very helpful. The other one is called left nasal breathing. When we breathe in and out just through our left nostril, we, we calm down the nervous system. It triggers the part of the brain that calms us down. So what you do is you cover gently the right side of your, your nose and you just cover that nostril and you breathe in and out very, very slowly through your left nostril. And you will find that this is extremely calming. The key to self-care is to do these things when you are feeling calm and practice when you are feeling calm because you want to build your mindfulness and your stress management muscle. If you are anxious and you try to do these things when you're very anxious, it may help. But what you want to do is you want to build it in throughout your day so that when you do feel anxious, you will notice over time that your anxiety will decrease over situations that you're dealing with because you, you have a toolbox of tools that you're using. Next slide, please. So how to navigate our normal, this new normal. I'm not sure we've actually gotten to new normal yet. I'm not quite sure what that looks like. But if you are in any kind of treatment, if you're in counseling, if you're seeing a doctor, 
whatever treatment you're in, please continue with that treatment. Oftentimes we say we're too busy to continue, but it's really important to continue counseling. If you're seeing a psychiatrist, you're seeing a medical doctor for your blood pressure, don't forget to have tests taken. Whatever it is that you need to be doing, make a list, make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Have a daily routine and a schedule. Make sure people are probably now settling into working remote, but now that we're going back to reopening, people are gonna be shifting again. So look at your routine, getting up at the same time, getting dressed, showering, having a schedule within that routine, putting workouts, exercise into that schedule, putting in connecting with your friends in that schedule. And I love the list of making a list of the people you wanna stay connected with professionally and personally. Go back to what calms your mind. If you like to listen to music or you paint or you do yoga, whatever it is, try to reincorporate that back into your life. Next slide, please. So if you could use help, if you look at this survey and you are feeling anxious or having trouble sleeping, you're unable to relax without alcohol, drugs, or any other type of destructive behavior, having problems getting your work completed, no noticing increase in errors, lost interest in things you used to enjoy, experiencing emotional numbness, or of course, suicidal thoughts, please reach out for help. Either you can call me, you can call your doctor, but please reach out to somebody. Next slide, please. And don't forget the lawyer assistance program. It's free, it's confidential, it's a counseling program, and it is for any type of personal issues. It's available to all lawyers in Maryland. It's, a lawyer, it's available to judges and law school students. We have a statewide network of counselors who are throughout the state that can meet with you virtually and we'll be able to meet with you in person as well. If you are ever concerned about an attorney, you can always reach out to me. It can be completely anonymous. It will not go to attorney grievance. It does not get them in trouble, but it may end up actually saving their life. We lost one of our committee members to an overdose. If it can happen on our committee, it can happen anywhere. So please, if you're ever concerned, please give me a call. We'll, we'll do our best to make sure that person is safe. We have a peer support group of lawyers and judges throughout the state that have either gone through the program or are very, very passionate about the program and they act as mentors. I've had one of our circuit judges playing tennis with one of my clients. It was a great support for both of them. And it's a very, it's a great network and a great support. Next slide, please. Any type of issues. I don't know what happened to this slide, but anyways, this slide says any type of issues. It says financial anxiety, depressed, wellness, whatever is going on with you. And um, you can call us, don't reinvent the wheel. If you, if you need assistance, I have a lot of resources. I work with attorneys all the time. So don't reinvent the wheel. I will help you navigate whatever it is that you're looking for. Next slide, please. So that we can read this one. And the health and wellness page, the COVID health and, health and wellness page is on our COVID page. There's a button that says health and wellness, and it has all kinds of resources. Tomorrow, Shally will be doing a, a yoga workout at 12 o'clock, and you can join that. We also have online classes, the tip of the day, emergency resources, home workouts, my tip sheets are on there. So lots of really great information for you to find. Next slide, please. And there's my contact information. It's probably easiest to reach me through email, but I'm happy to return your messages. And I'm just, also you can reach our committee members as well. If for some reason you don't wanna reach out to me, you can reach out to our committee members. Thank you. I, I guess Lisa, just a couple of questions for you. Um, sure. first, the, you. You gave your email address. If people had um, questions about other resources, websites about giving other, um, exercise techniques and stuff like that would you you'd be willing to share them with them if they if they ask for it obviously sure we have a lot on the health and wellness page and for our members we have the health and wellness portal that has a lot of different websites but absolutely if they can't find something they can always give me a call and i'll find it for them and just a another this is a personal thing like when we, we realize that we're going to have a lot of time off and, and home and all that stuff and I sort of didn't want to have to go back to work and say, why didn't I get those things that I should have done? Like, you know, reorganizing the basement or, and then, cause at the end of this, obviously we are going to have to go back to work and things are going to get back to normal. Is that one thing you would suggest? Like, obviously we're not knowing when this is going to ever happen again and hopefully it doesn't, but you know, is that a good thing to keep, you know, give yourself goals and stuff to, to move ahead? Like, um, you know, the projects and stuff like that uh, outside of work, obviously. 
I think, you know, I've heard that a lot that people say I could be organizing my basement, I could be cleaning things out, but they just don't feel like it. I think that you have to kind of pace what it is that you want to do and give yourself a little bit of a break. If you don't want to org I believe me, I could go and organize my basement and I haven't done it. So I think it's really important just to realize that although you may not have the time, you might need to take that time just to take a step back. We are so inundated with everything that's going on that sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? The basement's gonna be there next week and I will just deal with it then or next year or it's not going anywhere. So if you wanna do it, great. If you wanna set a goal, great. If you're gonna set a goal, break it down into very small pieces and just give yourself one thing to do and oftentimes you feel that you move forward with it a lot easier. Awesome, thank you for that. Thank you. Lisa, I have a quick question for you, which is do you um, come and speak to groups uh, like specialty bars or smaller groups of judges, maybe the circuits or whatever, do you do that at all? Absolutely, I do a lot of that. I've actually done about five or I about five or six in the last few weeks. So absolutely I do that. Well thank you very much. That was fantastic information and I thank learned you. a lot. I've learned from everybody today and I really thank you for that. You. Our our next speaker is Pilar C. Nichols. Uh, Pilar is a principal attorney at Offit Kerman and she is in the family law practice group there. Uh, Pilar has extensive trial experience and focuses on litigation settlement of divorce, child custody, complex property division, and international di divorce disputes. Um, there, I think there is connected with this uh, extensive biography and you can find her biography at, at her Offit Kerman website. Before private practice, she was an assistant state's attorney for Prince George's County. And she has also served during her career as a legislative and regulatory counsel for the National Association of Officers and Advisors. She is a proud graduate of Penn State with a Bachelor's of Science and of the Catholic University of America Law School. Today, she continues as an adjunct professor at Catholic University, and she is also a, a standing member of the faculty of the Maryland Judicial College. She is a daily record top 50 women's super lawyer. Uh, she's also a super person. I happen to know Pilar, and she's fantastic to know, uh, and has a great sense of humor. And we are pleased to have her today. She is fluent in Spanish, and I believe she is currently on the board of the Hispanic Bar Association of Maryland. Pilar? Uh, thank you, Judge Reed. Um, instead of uh, developing a quick pitch, I think I'm just going to start inviting you to come with me to places. And uh, I, I enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, so uh, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint because um, I was asked to, um, uh, which they're very very nice. Um, I was asked to speak more on how this situation has affected uh, me and other uh, attorneys in my in my uh, type of position and what exactly um, I've been doing to overcome that. And so for me, I'm, I'm in private practice. I do family law, criminal law, and um, with that, um, there's kind of an intersection there and I do an, a lot of domestic violence. And so in terms of how I'm affected, the biggest issue that I have uh, professionally, I'll start with that, is that you know I'm I'm a litigator, um, and so my my job is in court. That is really where I do most of my work. Uh, and while I um, you know draft pleadings and you know write letters, uh, because we all know that family law lawyers we love to write letters, um, but uh, you know for me the fact that we haven't been able to go to court make our arguments, present uh, present things in court has been very difficult. And it's also very difficult to explain to clients that they're not getting their day in court and I don't know when they're going to. And so unfortunately, because of the volume of cases, we've had to um, cancel some of the uh, hearings that people were, were intending on having and the, and those aren't gonna be rescheduled. So certain temporary hearings, certain types of status hearings, they're just not going to be heard. And then um, when we go back, they're going to have um, the cases that were already scheduled and then the backlog of all the cases that um, need to be recalendered. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's anxiety provoking for lawyers, it's anxiety provoking for the clients. You know, we have to make sure that they, you know, that they understand um, we just don't know. And a lot of times, uh, one of the things that you give advice to your clients on as um, as their trial attorney is how long is this gonna take? 
How's this gonna go? How, how is that process gonna unfold? And so a lot of things I've been saying to my clients, well, I could tell you exactly what would have happened pre-COVID and I, um, that's what we explain to them. And then we have to tell them that, you know, we're going to add some, um, some time to those things. So that's been one of the biggest effects in terms of practicing. Um, also with our type of uh, job, we have a lot of pleadings and I practice in one of the three jurisdictions that does not have MDEC. And so um, we've had to overcome a lot of challenges. Um, uh, most recently in my jurisdiction in Montgomery County, our judge, uh, our administrative judge has enacted a uh, email address that we can send things to. And um, we're really hoping that that's going to make things more efficient. It really has made things easier. Uh, but, uh, you know, we still have pro state litigants um, and uh, other people who are filing things uh, in paper. And you have mountains of paperwork uh, that is uh, just mounting in the clerk's office. And so, of course, there's the delay of things getting docketed and things getting date stamped returned. And so, you know, there's the issue of the deck get filed and hopefully they received it, things like that. So that's that's always some kind of, you know, a little bit of an effect. Um, another issue that I think a lot of people don't think about um, when you actually represent clients is that, especially in a sensitive topic like family law, they're with their kids. And the number one thing that we do is talk to our clients away from their kids. We don't want our clients, and most certainly they don't want to be talking about their custody case or their child support or the bad things that the other person has been doing um, in front of their children. And so because there is no school and now no camp, um, then you know we have to figure out how do we get time away so that they can speak to their attorneys about issues affecting the little ones that are running around them without them hearing. So oftentimes we have to schedule things two days in advance. We can't just call and have this conversation because they're with their children. We, they can't have an open and honest conversation about their concerns and what's going on. So, um, you know, sometimes we schedule them around nap time. Sometimes we schedule things where they coordinate to have them outside and have the neighbor watch them over the fence. Um, I've had plenty of times where I've had to have very early phone calls before the kid wakes up, very late phone calls after bedtime. And, um, people who are already in a schedule, it's, well, I can talk to you Friday afternoon because you know dad comes and picks them up or I've got to talk to them on the weekend. It's not their weekend. So those are challenges that really affect um, affect us because it's very different than talking about you know a contract or some kind of transaction. You really don't want these children to hear um, what's being said about them. Um, one other thing that I have is um, that affects me personally and I'm sure many others is I have a large large percentage of Spanish speaking clients. And so with my clients, one of the things that I do with them is I sit with them and I translate documents for them. And, you know, we, we, um, you know, we have those kind of interactions where I'm explaining to them um, and uh, usually at a conference table, what the document says, what does it mean? How does it affect them? And that's a lot harder uh, when you aren't able to see somebody face to face. We also have, um, and you know, all clients, but you know, uh, or all attorneys have, clients of different levels of education. And so they are more or, you know, some are more and some are less um, adept at being able to send you a narrative that you need uh, through email. Uh, they're used to writing things down. They don't really do computers. Um, you know, we have clients with different levels of tech savviness. You know, nowadays we do see a lot of silver divorces and you have people who are much older and they have no idea how to use Zoom or, you know, most certainly, uh, you know, Skype for business or Microsoft Teams. And so those things are very, very difficult. Um, we have clients that are very stressed out about how much money they're spending on the interaction, the litigation, because they're undergoing financial struggles. Either in most, in most of these households, either one of them has lost a job. And so um, either the one that is the payee or the payor there's still less money to go around to support these children that they're that they're caring for. And so that obviously is something that um, very much affects the clients and how we um, how we interact with them um, in terms of, you know, the private private 
the private practice aspect of it. You know, a lot of what we do is we market via happy hours and we market via going out to lunch. Those are things that we can't do. We also now in this time where, you know, things are, uh, you know, we have to be careful and make sure that we're, we're being responsible. We have to be careful with our budgets, you know, and then on a personal level, schools are canceled. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think that a lot of us knew that schools were going to be canceled for the rest of the year. And we kind of gotten it, got, you know, got them in uh, the cancellations in pieces. So we had a little bit of hope. Um, and then that hope was, was crushed, um, uh, kind of like a summer camp um, for me. But, um, you know, that has been a challenge and there's been the uncertainty. And so um, my kids, I have two boys, very, 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 very active boys. And so um, they're five and seven. And so I am trying to talk to clients, trying to do work trying to draft pleadings, trying to draft motions, trying to talk to opposing counsels. And I am trying to work and teach and deal with the fight and, you know, and all of those things. So thankfully, um, I have found that clients, opposing counsels, um, the professionals and experts that we're speaking to, everybody has been just incredibly understanding because it is, I'd say, a good 35% of my phone calls that somewhere in the middle go, yes, honey, I'm working. Just give me one second. I'm very sorry. Yes, go downstairs. Yes, I know. I understand. Tell him, say I'm sorry. And so I have to like, I have to do these things where I'm, I'm negotiating with my children, begging really for them to go downstairs for a minute while I finish this phone call. And that's really, really stressful when, you know, you have a, cry, a client on the phone crying because their ex-husband's new wife cut their daughter's hair, right? And so those are the kind of things that we're dealing with and that person's upset and I'm trying to juggle and my client, you know, my kid's got a black eye because, you know, one threw a magnet tile at the other. And so those are things that we're all dealing with on a personal level um, while still trying to, you know, give our clients the service while still, you know, uh, working and billing hours and doing all of that stuff. Um, you know, working from home, at least for me, is significantly less efficient than working in my office where I have everything that I need. Uh, now, you know, I also don't get my breaks. I don't get my breaks in my car. I have a 45 minute commute, had a 45 minute commute to the office and I would have my eBooks and my radio and my coffee by myself when it was still hot. And so those kind of things are gone. And, um, you know, after a while, you kind of start losing your your motivation and you have to do things to get yourself back into it and um, away from my staff as all of us are. And I miss my coworkers. And at the same time, I'm never alone. And so all of those things, you know, um, kind of start, uh, you know, wearing on your efficiency and motivation and, you know, your can do attitude after a while. And, you know, there's the anxiety of, you know, is school going to close? Well, that happened. Now, then it's, you know, summer camp. Okay, well, there's no summer camp for June. So now is there going to be for July? Is Montgomery County going to enter phase two? Is that never going to happen? Are kids going to come in to school in September? Are they going to be out of school until January? Am I going to, you know, curl myself off the roof of my building? All of those things, like start kind of um, coming into your head, kidding Lisa. Um, and so you have to basically um, push through. And so one of the things that um, I'm going to wrap up with, which um, they had asked me to speak of is kind of what have I done to adapt and get it done? And so what I have done is the times that I do have someone in the house, the times that my husband is there. So I have this wonderful luxury of having my husband work um, evenings and uh, some weekends. And so it's, it's tons of fun. And so the time that I do have available where somebody's watching the kids, I lock myself in my office and I have my own time and I got the most amazing soundproof headphones and they work. And I go and I do as much as I can. I set up a space that really worked for me. And even now that we're gonna start unfolding the rollout plan for coming back into the office, it's still not gonna be every day. And so I still need to try to figure out how I'm gonna stay efficient. And so the, the thing that I did and I would recommend is to make that space the best space for you. Um, I think that the, the well, I, I've observed that the friends of mine that are having the hardest time 
are the ones that feel very in limbo. They're the ones that are working at their kitchen table with their children running around and maybe they're sharing the kitchen table with their spouse or something like that. Really working your own space, making it your workspace is really what's important. Um, so I got, a, uh, you know, I made sure that I had my desk that I was comfortable with that I could spread out on and my chair and, you know, if you need a printer, get a printer. You know, I I set got the monitor set up that I wanted. Um, also, I've really, really gotten into video calls as we all have, and I have found that even when um, I would have had the conversation that I'm having in the office by picking up the phone with a client, I'm actually saying, "Hey, let's set up a Teams call. I'll send you the link." And um, I've found that that's probably going to carry over later because it's much more it's much more personal. You really get a better idea of what someone's doing. And I've also found, because I take notes on my computer as I'm doing this, that I don't have to say, hold on, I'm typing. Give me, give me one second. Because they can see that I'm typing. So they pause. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot less of that. And there's just um, a, a much better connection. Um, I've been doing it with opposing counsels too, because with opposing counsels, you get to, you know, you could see each other in court and there's something about talking to each other. And it's kind of like, um, I say, you know, you have the keyboard bullies, right? Well, sometimes you also have people on the phone and they're a lot more likely to, you know, be a little bit more acrimonious or maybe not as nice when it's just over the phone. But when you've got them on a FaceTime call or when you've got them on a video call, it's amazing. The calls go so much smoother. Everyone's nicer to each other because you're always nicer to each other, more collegial, just face to face. Um, I've been working with uh, my opposing counsels in terms of sending documents um, electronically. Uh, every when new people come into a case or when this all started, a bunch of us have talked and said, okay, hey, can we can can we agree? We're gonna send letters and pleadings via email, okay? So we don't have them um, going to the office and they're sitting there for five days when we have a 15 day uh, turnaround to, you know, to, um, to answer to them um, in jurisdictions like mine where there's no MDAC. Um, and so we've been doing that. We've been doing discovery with, with links. Um, DocuSign and FedEx have become, um, you know, my greatest friends. DocuSign has been um, miraculous for us with um, people at home not having printers and scanners. You'd be surprised how many people just don't have printers and scanners at home. And so usually you would say, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get that done when I get to the office. Well, now they're not going to the office. So DocuSign has been fantastic. Um, you know, I've been sending thank you notes to people who have been referring people, um, handwritten thank you notes. And uh, a couple of people have uh, called me and said, it was great to get something in the mail in this time and it wasn't a bill. Um, and so, you know, that, that, um, that has definitely helped. I've used this time to expand into something that I've wanted to do for a long time that I've had training for a long time and never had a chance to do. And that's mediation. Um, I've had the ability to now do that and do it via, um, via zoom. Um, I think that's something that's very, um, helpful to, the people around you and that can help with your creativity and an outlet is writing blogs or newsletters that you send out electronically. And you can do that um, geared towards, you know, the people who are struggling with like the case related issues, like the decrease in um, alimony payments or child support or the, the job loss or what's going on in America today and address them and uh, address the issues and send uh, things that are motivating and how, how we can, um, all, you know, contribute to things and, you know, what resources are there available? Um, I've been lucky. I surround myself with a great team. Uh, we have a Zoom call meeting every day. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a standing, I have standing Zoom happy hours um, with um, a bunch of different people on different days. Our um, eighth floor, um, we, every Monday we get together, we all miss each other. We see each other, those who can log on, log on. It's just a recurring Zoom link and we all see each other and it's fantastic. Um, I try to get dressed and um, you know, there's that the meme floating around Facebook where they say, you know, oh, I'm changing from my day pajamas to my night pajamas. And that's funny. And I think that it was funny and true for me for the first week, but then I realized that I was not feeling good about myself and I didn't want that. And so I started to get dressed um, and you know, actually doing my hair and things like that. And I'm not saying I'm wearing, you know, dresses and heels or anything, but at least it's something that, you know, I, um, I have been able to, um, to make, to do, to make myself feel better. Um, I've also, um, indulged in the things that I enjoy, which are, um, crafting because I'm a craft nerd and baking because I love baking and I make bread now. And I indulge in guilty pleasures like reading people magazine, um, you know, exercise. And the biggest thing is, I think, is just be easy. Take it easy on yourself and give yourself a break and know that we are all 
not at our best. Um, I think that um, doing little things that make you happy is really important. So I um, I get teased by my two best girlfriends um, that I have a uh, Amazon shopping problem. And the thing about that is, is that I go and I look for funny little silly things to do on Zoom calls to make my friends laugh. So I'm tortured by my friends because I bought a rubber chicken that makes a noise, but it's hysterical and I bring it out on Zoom and um, I do it on like the little the calls and people laugh and it's something that brings me a lot of joy. Um, and the last thing I would say is that, you know, keep in touch with your friends and commiserate. Everyone's feeling the same way and it's, um, you know, one thing I've noticed from from our generation is that we get through things easier now, uh, the hard things that we go through in life because we talk about them and we get through them. And so I think that if we commiserate with each other and help each other and give each other tips, then we'll be able to get things um, get through things easier than trying to hide them and pretend that everything's OK because everything is not OK. So talk to your friends, know that you're not alone and get tips for how they handle. P Pilar, uh, just going back to one of the things you started with mm -hmm. um, and said, talking about with your clients um, uh, about like, my question is, is sort of uh, also related to in terms of my own. I'm a state's attorney, so I deal with victims of, uh, in the special victims unit. So a question would be in terms of how do you have that difficult conversation um, that would be easier to sit down in the office um, face to face with somebody, you know, some topic that even you're, you know, uncomfortable you know you just don't even want to have the conversation but you have to have that how do you do that on the phone or via a video chat with especially with somebody that you've never even had a, a, a real relationship with yeah so i've i un unfortunately i do have to have a lot of those hard conversations and a lot of those especially in the domestic violence arena um so what i have learned is that you try to create a little bit of a cone around the call. So those types of calls, I make sure that I um, tell, you know, for example, if it's my husband, whoever's watching the kids, and I make sure that they are there and I tell them, I have a really important, really serious phone call that I cannot have interrupted. Please make sure I lock my door. And then what I do is I go in and I actually put on headphones, even if I don't need it, because um, I don't want people to wonder if someone else is listening. So I, um, I actually make like a little show about it just so they know I'm on the headphone. So I'll connect it and I'll say, OK, just want to make sure you're on my headphones. Can you hear me? They'll say, yeah. And I'm like, OK. Um, and I tell them, I said, you know, I just want to let you know, um, you know, I am home, but I'm in my home office. You're on my headphones. Um, you know, we have complete privacy. And if it's somebody that um, like, for example, if it's a if it's a case and it just got referred to me and this is the initial intake, I do a little introduction and I and I acknowledge that it's awkward. And I acknowledge that, um, you know, that it's hard for them. I also try to break those up and say to them that we'll get into kind of a, a higher level thing. And then I'll, we'll talk again. Um, if we have that luxury, um, I try to have my clients write me narratives because it's a lot easier for them to do that. Obviously for a state's attorney, you know, I, I think you're probably more into the interaction. You don't really want them to have a, a narrative to give you a, lo a lot of the times, but um, I try to break it up. And so one, I try to introduce myself, tell them, get them to know me, get them um, to know a little bit more of a high level of, of, you know, what's going on or get myself to know a little bit more high level. And then I try to set another one, but definitely I would do that on a video call because there's still that connection. And I think that if you can make that person feel that, you know, they can see your face, there's a, that's the whole thing is whether you're physically next to each other or not, them seeing your face, them seeing the expression, then knowing that you're not rolling your eyes um, when you're talking to them. They can see the look of empathy on your face when that really makes the connection. So I think that making them on video, letting them know they're in a safe space, it's private. Yes, I'm home, but you know, please understand that that this is this is private. Awesome. Those were some great tips. Uh, I really appreciate that and uh, everything you talked about here today. Thank you. Yolanda. Good afternoon, all. Thank you, Mark. I'm Yolanda Sung Yam, the co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And at this time, it's my honor to be able to bring the thank yous 
and to close this session out. So I have a lot of thank yous that I need to do. And first I wanna thank um, by saying thank you to the presenters for the insight and all of the relevant information and advice you provided. Um, I've heard, yes, Judge Reed, that's right. Um, I've heard um, most of the speakers speak before and each time I feel like I learned something from you. And so even though I've been involved in the planning of this, I still feel like I learned. So thank you very much for taking your time and doing this with us today. Uh, the next thing I wanna thank is the moderators who kept the session flowing smoothly. So thank you very much to Judge Reed and thank you very much, Mark, uh, for handling the question and answers in the chat box. So we appreciate you doing that as well. Um, if we're already on the slide, so I wanted to thank our co-sponsors and I know Daryl thanked them at the beginning, um, but just another thank you to the J. Franklin Bourne Bar Association, the LGBTQ Bar Association of Maryland, the Maryland Hispanic Bar Association, the Maryland Municipal Attorneys Association, the MSBA State and Local Government Section, the Sobolov Jewish Law Society, and, and the Women's Bar Association of Maryland. So thank you to each of those groups for recognizing the importance of this session and agreeing to co-sponsor and spread the word about the session. And lastly, well, not lastly, actually, I want to thank everyone that attended today. So I know you could have been on a zillion other Zoom calls, meetings, webinars. I think we all have 50,000 of them lined up, but we appreciate you, you know, taking the time and actually joining on with us um, because you felt that this was important and something about this session resonated with you. So I hope it was worth your time and you staying and, and hearing the presentations. And I know the committee is out there. And so last but not least, a big thank you to the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, who does, yes, thank you, Daryl. I love the virtual clapping, um, who despite COVID and the nationwide unrest, they've continued to meet and plan and try to figure out programming that they felt was relevant um, to the members of the Maryland State Bar. So I appreciate, and Daryl also appreciates everything that the committee has done. Um, as I close out, I just wanted to kind of give a reminder to us as attorneys. As attorneys, we're usually dealing with our clients' um, highs and lows, the problems that they may bring to us. And oftentimes we fail to remember that we are in the midst of a storm as well. And I think that this session clearly highlighted um, the need for you to take time for yourself, for you to connect with your network. Um, we've had to find creative ways to do that. And I encourage you to find innovative ways to work. And you, you always hear the access to justice, the access to you know, law and services. And this time, you know, unfortunately for the reason, but this time it's shown us that access is greater than the, the traditional way that we have looked at practicing law and meeting with clients and meeting with the community. So I encourage you to continue um, to find those innovative ways. Um, I encourage you to reinvent yourself and your office um, and the services offered. Um, and then also to remember to take, take care of yourself. Lisa gave some wonderful advice. And I think all three speakers, you know, kind of intertwined self-care into their presentation. And I think that's extremely important because if you aren't taking care of yourself, of course, you aren't able to help someone else. So remember, um, so I'm hoping, and so these are some of my hopes that after the COVID pandemic, everyone can rebuild and revitalize yourselves and your offices. Um, I'm hoping after the protests and unrest that we will have a more equitable social, legal, and criminal justice system. Um, also, Daryl and I invite anyone that's interested in joining the Diversity and Inclusion Committee to contact us. The committee is an important function of the Maryland State Bar, and we've continued to find ways to engage the legal community as equity and then the promotion of equity is just as important in the legal field as it is in any other profession. We encourage you to join our committee because inclusionary measures must be looked at not only in this committee, but all throughout the Maryland State Bar through the leadership, 
through the sections, through the committees, and then also looking at your firms and your organizations. So two things as I close out, I just wanna tell you to remember that this too shall pass. We find ourselves in turbulent times, but this too shall pass. After a storm, there is always a rainbow. And after all those April showers, we are graced with Mayflowers. So I'm hoping that you also will get something from this conversation about the turbulent times we find ourselves. And as I'm closing out, just a reminder that Treble is doing a virtual meet and greet. I have the pleasure of introducing the co-founder and CEO of Treble, David Gertler, who will lead us through the powerful presentation on, on business networking. So again, I thank all of the attendees. And David, I'm passing the mic on over to you. Great. Hi, everybody. This is David Gertler, CEO and co-founder of Treble. Treble is a business networking platform. And in, just as we wrap up, uh, we're going to be hosting this on Zoom. And the Zoom number is on the screen right now. It's 870-526-83210. Uh, so join us on Zoom. It'll be very interactive. So you'll have an opportunity. Everybody will get a few moments to introduce themselves. And again, so, so many great ideas that were presented uh, from the various speakers. This is a great opportunity for you to build those networks, build a sense of community, give back to others, and let others help you. So hope to see you on the Zoom session uh, once this concludes.